Welcome to Nurturing Our Roots from Freedom to Slavery, Zoom sessions with Antoinette and Karen. We are live every Tuesday at seven o'clock Central Standard Time where the stories of ordinary people with extraordinary stories and family history come alive. If you have a story or any family history that you would like to share with us, we would love to hear from you. Please contact us at email at our email address nurturingourroots at gmail.com. I'm going to turn it over to my co-host. Hi, Karen. Hi, Antoinette. So good to see you. Likewise, likewise. Hi to your guests. Hi, uh, our, our guest tonight is Nagesh Rucker, who was with us last month uh, when we talked about the Louisa Mahoney story. And so welcome, Nagesh. Hi, Nagesh. Thank you, Antoinette. Good to be here with you again. We're happy to have you. Well, the guest and I are going to go a little bit more in detail about uh, some of the resources we use as we are researching um, uh, the history of Jesuit enslavement. And so just to uh, back things up a little bit, um, my husband is a direct descendant of several of the people who were sold by the Jesuit priest of Georgetown University. And the guest is also a direct descendant. In fact, my husband Kenneth and the guest both descend from Harry Mahoney. Uh, but tonight we're not going to talk so much specifically about our families, but more about uh, some of the resources we use as we uh, research together. And some of that re uh, research that we do together is often done on Thursday nights on a weekly Zoom call that um, I host and, and I, I, I would dare say the guest is almost like my co-host because she often uh, is just coming through with so many different links to information. And so um, I just wanna share a little bit about how I came into knowledge about this history and the guest will do the same about how she came into the knowledge about this history. About four years ago, I saw an article in the New York Times paper that talked about how uh, the Jesuit priest of Georgetown University had sold 272 people, uh, enslaved Africans to Louisiana. And that became a big deal because students at Georgetown were protesting that two buildings on the campus were being named for two men who sold slaves and the students weren't having any part of that and I'm just so proud of those students. Well because those students um, made such a big deal of it, they had a sit-in in the president's office and everything, the New York Times picked up the story. I saw the story. I saw there was a surname in there, Hawkins, and I knew that my husband's uh, grandmother was a Hawkins and they mentioned this little town called Maringuin or Mangren as my father-in-law called it. And so I knew it had to be my, my family's, um, my husband's family, my family. And so I contacted the genealogist working on the project and she, I sent her my family tree, what I had with the Hawkins family. She sent me back a tree that included two more generations of Hawkinses along with uh, a family of butlers. And from that point on, I got busy working, trying to find some of the descendants and ended up uh, getting together with a group of descendants. And we created the Georgetown, um, the GU272 Descendants Association. And while I'm no longer with the association, I have created a, a online group called Descendants of Jesuit Enslaved Ancestors. And it is through that group, we have a Facebook page. If you can go and like our page on Facebook, Descendants of Jesuit Enslaved Ancestors. We're on all social media. And we also um, have a group for descendants and people who are DNA connected to some of the descendants. And we'll talk a little bit more later on in the, pro in the show about how do you know if you're DNA connected to someone um, who has been verified as a descendant. And, um, and I, I will say, uh, you know, we've been meeting 
it seems like for the last six months, at least every Thursday night, um, and it's parts uh, support group, part social group, part research group. Uh, it's, it's if you're trying to figure things out, you know, there folk, we try to help you figure if you're connected or how you're connected to each other. And some, some of the folks who join us every Thursday, they don't like when we uh, sometimes have to skip um, a Thursday. And so I've just totally enjoyed it. It has really made a difference in my life in terms of connecting to the descendants and to the history. So Nagas, how did you come into knowledge about how you were connected to Jesuit enslaved ancestors? Sure, thanks, Karen. So um, like you, I also stumbled across the article in the New York Times. Mm -hmm. and, and so I just totally enjoyed it. It has really and, been in my life. In terms of and I was able to see uh, my ancestor, Louisa Mahoney, who I already had done some research on. I knew that she was enslaved, but I did not know the Jesuit connection or the connection to the sale, and that's because my ancestor actually, although she was on the list to be sold, was able to escape and remain in Maryland. Um, so I was able to um, get some information from some of my older relatives and cousins who knew uh, some of the information, but were not aware of the connection to the Maryland Jesuits, were not aware of the Louisiana sale, or how Georgetown University benefited. So um, yes, it's been extremely, I think, um, beneficial to me to be able to connect with other descendants on our Thursday call and in our Facebook group in order to learn more about um, how our ancestors have contributed and how we contributed, how we contribute present day to everything. Um, even though we have um, a history that I think is in some cases difficult to discuss, I do look at it as um, positive because I'm connected to people who exhibit such resiliency. May I please ask a question? How is the COVID, uh, the pandemic, uh, affecting getting out and doing any research in any courthouse or retrieving records from anywhere? Oh, so there is no, <laughs> um, because of the pandemic, there essentially is very little research that you can do face to face. There was for a brief time period, um, I think I'm speaking from the, the Maryland perspective here because I live in Washington, DC. So for a brief period, the Maryland State Archives was taking um, requests individual requests, but because there was such an outpouring, um, they have since stopped accepting requests and the response times were very, very long. Um, much of the information in the Georgetown Library, they have a special collection that has the Jesuit archive information. Um, to my knowledge, that, that on-site um, research is only for graduate and undergraduate students. Um, again, you can send them an email asking them for information, but because so many people have been trying to do that and because I believe they've scaled back the number of people on site, mm -hmm. um, it, it's been very difficult to do. Luckily for us, we have a lot of information online that we can access. And that's a that's very good, good thing too, because uh, I know it has to affect it somewhere, but I just want to hear from you, you know, to what extent. Uh, I'm very happy that I'm still able to access courthouse records in the areas in which I live. Um, or I thought the uh, Maryland State Archives was given um, doing appointments. Are they still doing that? I believe they were doing appointments. I saw a notification I believe a few weeks ago now that some of the cases have, have increased in the state of Maryland that they were no longer taking appointments. Um, Again, this was a few weeks ago, so I could be incorrect, but the last email that I saw said that they had paused on taking appointments, um, I think for the remainder of the year until they see some differences in the cases in the area. I will say that they have opened up some of the records that are previously records you could only get if you were at the state archives. So I have seen things like death certificates and those types of records for certain time periods have been 
um, opened up so you can access a lot of that information online. And previously you had to actually be in their building in order to access it. So that's actually really good. You can, um, so there is some resource, resources that they have made available to us knowing that people can actually come visit them. And that's a good thing. I know our library system have uh, stepped up uh, their resources online. And we know that there's a lot that you can get online. Um, and for me, I, that's what I'm, I'm doing. I'm just doing it all online. I, I am totally um, just afraid to interact with anything that I have to touch <laughs> that, that someone else may have touched. And so, because I know at our state archive, you can get an appointment to go into the Louisiana State Archives, but um, it's just, it's not a risk that I'm willing to take uh, right now. So I have absolutely relied on online resources. And, and in a way, it's allowed me to um, focus more, <laughs> you know, cause sometimes when you're uh, trying to get out the house and go here and go there, you don't do as much as you could do uh, if you just stayed home and read some stuff. And so um, I, I accept that right now, I just have to utilize whatever resources I can get to at home, but I can't wait to be able to get out there and get into courthouses and uh, go back to the state archives. I, I do look forward to that. But we know that there's a lot that you can find online. And um, <clears throat> one of the things I'll, I'll share is that, um, Oftentimes, uh, we, we talk about the Jesuits, uh, we talk about Georgetown, uh, the Jesuits of Georgetown. We, we don't stop to think that they were someone else, somewhere else. And so uh, just to kick off some of what we're going to talk about, I want to share a map of where some of the other locations were that um, the Jesuits have uh, institutions of higher learning. And, um, and it's not just that they have institutions of higher learning. I guess you could also chime in about some of the other locations that, that we've discovered in, in, in the research that we have been doing. Um, let me see here, make this a little bigger. A lot of times people think about just Georgetown. And if you look at this map, Jesuits have uh, schools all over the country. And we know that we have found some DNA connections to uh, location, um, especially from, from my husband in the St. Louis area and in Kentucky. Nagasa, you wanna share or uh, talk anything about any of these other locations on this map? Sure. Um, there's also been um, connections to Mobile, Alabama, which is, um, I believe where Spring Hill College is located. Um, and there is work going on with the Jesuits. Um, they re refer to it as slavery memory and recon reconciliation work um, that indicates that there were either folks who were actually enslaved and owned by Spring Hill College or Spring Hill College used enslaved people for labor at that location. I haven't seen any names yet there, but um, I certainly do match, uh, have a number of DNA matches to folks in Mobile. How many, how many new people are you all getting uh, to join your research group uh, weekly? You know, I haven't stopped to count. We have a, a core group of people uh, on the call every, um, every Thursday, we have a, a good 12 to 15, sometimes 20. If I have a guest speaker, we may have about, I think we had about 40 people on that call oh, really? when we had a prof prof Professor Thomas uh, on. And so it just depends on um, if we have a, a specified topic. And um, I think I hear more from people who reach out through our Facebook page in terms of new people. Um, they'll reach out through Facebook or through Ancestry saying, hey, I think I'm connected to this history. And, and, that, and that'll just actually lead me to uh, take us into um, another uh, uh, topic here actually. Uh, it's about how people can figure out if they are connected to this history. Oftentimes they will uh, say, hey, 
um, I, I, um, I have a particular surname. So, you know, we, we showed those locations and one of the other places in Louisiana, I forgot to mention is, and it's not on there and that's St. Landry Parish, Louisiana. And that's because uh, though the Jesuits had a school down there, um, St. Charles College, it's no longer an active institution of higher learning, but we also have seen some DNA connections especially many of the Maryland descendants have seen connections to St. Landry Parish, Louisiana. And that is because um, in the mid 1820s, the Jesuits had taken some of their enslaved people from Maryland to St. Louis. And their St. Louis College where, where uh, and they're doing some active research around this history as well. So then later, some of those Jesuits from St. Louis went down to uh, uh, Grand Couteau, Louisiana and they opened up uh, St. Um, St. Charles College. And so sometimes, uh, in fact, some of the surnames in that area, you may see Eaglin, uh, Hawkins, um, uh, and Goff, G-O-U-G-H, just like Goff, but Goff. Mm -hmm. Those are some of the surnames you may see down in St. Landry Parish and Mahoney. Karen, I'm looking at this name, Nolan. Have you checked any of your ancestors to see if the Nolans on your side could perhaps be one of uh, the ancestors? It, it makes me wonder. It mm -hmm. makes me wonder because my Aunt Carmen, my dad's sister, is a distant DNA match to my husband. And okay. so we haven't figured out how the Nolans connect up to everyone else just yet. Mm -hmm. um, so the Georgetown Memory Project has found connections to many of these surnames, but I, 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 I'm not aware of a connection to a Nolan. Uh, have you run across that surname, Nagas? She's muted. I haven't yet, um, but that's not to say that it doesn't exist. I think um, the surname has been expanded over time. Um, we've, we've been able to add people if we, the Descendants Association has added people um, over time because there are names there that I know when I first started doing research were not there. So um, I think, you know, this is an opportunity for me to go back and recheck some of my connections. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think some of those additional names were added because of some of the St. Louis research and also finding uh, uh, Kentucky connections and that kind of thing as well. If I can just, if you don't mind, uh, the names that I recognize that is in the St. Helena and Tangsboro Hall area would be the Butlers, the Browns, the Campbells, uh, which is where um, Tyler Perry and uh, I think Antoinette got frozen for a second. Um, she mentioned the butlers and, and when she comes back, I'm asking to pick up back where um, Tyler Perry, she mentioned Tyler Perry, but uh, the butlers, you know, um, in the guest, you and I have been talking about these butlers and these Harrells. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the uh, twins come out of Mississippi. A lot of them come out of uh, mm -hmm. Pike County, Mississippi. Uh, uh, you, you froze up uh, when you mentioned Tyler Perry. We didn't hear anything after that until you okay. got to the Tyler Perry family comes through the Campbell family. Mm. Okay, so that's in St. Helena Parish. The Quins, I recognize this family from Pike County, Mississippi, uh, and they are in um, Tangsboro Parish. And I recognize the Ware family as well as the West family is a huge family in St. Helena. So those are names that I know just off the top of memory. And, and I would tell anyone, if you are having, um, you recognize any of these names and you can trace some of your ancestry back to Maryland. Uh, and if you've done a DNA test, and I'm gonna put up a list of the Georgetown memory project uh, kit alphabets in just a minute. But uh, if you can trace your history back uh, to slavery period uh, in Maryland, you have a connection to any of these names. Now, when the ancestors were brought to Louisiana, they were brought to Ascension Parish, 
Iberville Parish and Terrebonne Parish. But we have been seeing some connections to East Feliciana. Um, I think it was with some of the butlers. Um, and, and there is a butler family from Iberville Parish that does connect to Harrells from East Feliciana. Uh, and so I've been uh, kind of pursuing that link, trying to figure out just what that is, because understanding what our Harrell history is, we know that pretty much in this area, the Harrells who exist came down with old fat Levi, as we've talked about before. And they, many of them ended up in uh, St. Helena and East Feliciana. And so I, I, I believe that those who ended up in Iberville Parish had some kind of a genetic connection to the group that came down with our ancestors from South Carolina um, into Louisiana. Um, I, I just have to, be, I just have to believe that 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 connection exists. Let's see here. And uh, this is a, a list of the uh, Georgetown Memory Project DNA kit. Um, initials. The Georgetown Memory Project is run by Richard Cellini, and he created that to help find descendants. It does not have any connection to Georgetown University, just to be clear. And um, initially, Richard and uh, Judy Riffle and, and also Melissa Ruffner, the, the Judy and Melissa are genealogists working with Richard, they uh, did the research on several families, and then they had uh, some of the older members of those families that they had already researched, they had them take, uh, <coughs> take a DNA test. And so the initials you see represent some of those people who took a DNA test. And they used Ancestry.com to do their DNA testing. And so oftentimes we'll get a message from someone who say, oh, well, I, met, I match MB and BM and DC. And, um, and, and oftentimes when we start our Thursday call, we'll ask people if they match any of those kits. And that's so that everybody on the call could hear everybody else and hear which kits they match. And then from that point, uh, if someone wants to dig a little bit deeper, we would just click on one of these links. This is not a clickable uh, page here, but we would click on one of those links, which would take you to a bare bones uh, type of uh, a family tree. And, and then from that uh, tree, we'll begin to try to figure out how you, your tree might match or connect up with the, this, uh, the people in, in, in these trees. And these are public trees on ancestry. And um, one of the things we were running into is that these trees, as you can see, some of them have 25 people, 24 people, 30, 37 people, and it wasn't enough information. And I'm going to stop sharing right now. It wasn't enough information for us to uh, really help some people. So uh, what we ended up doing, I and is that we uh, expanded some of the trees. So this is a, a tree of um, uh, one of the uh, people who have Hawkins in their lineage. My husband is a direct descendant from Caroline Hawkins who's shown in this tree. And, and there, uh-oh, I did not mean to unshare that. <laughs> Let me make it big again. And, and if you look, Okay, I'm gonna have to just stop touching. <laughs> if you uh, look at this tree, it goes to Sam Hawkins and Kate. Well, uh, Isaac Hawkins is born in 1773. So Sam and Kate are his parents. So that should take you to around the 1750s. And uh, what we did is we went through for each one of the, um, the Georgetown Memory Project trees and we expanded it where we could we, would, we listed all of the children that we could find in public records for each one of these direct line ancestors. And so by having the additional family names on the tree, we uh, are able to help people better figure out how they connect. 
because most times you're not connecting through the direct line ancestor of the person. You're connecting through one of their sisters or brothers or siblings. And so we found that by expanding the tree, we'll uh, be able to help more people. But also once this tree goes public, it's not public right now, but once we, we are uh, comfortable with the level of information we've added to the tree, we will make it public eventually and uh, people will be able to help themselves. But they can certainly join us on Thursday nights and we're happy to pull the tree up and help go through some stuff. So that would probably be the uh, best way to work with it for right now is to join us on Thursday nights. And I, a, I was gonna ask you if you had any questions about this. Yes, I have a question <laughs> for both you and the guests if both of you all would answer this. Um, do you feel that there is a spiritual connection that is guiding you to do this work, this research? And is there one ancestor that is stronger than the other in leading you to discover your family history? I'm letting the guest take that one. Um, I would say yes, there's definitely um, a spiritual connection there's a there's a strong strong guidance there i don't think that, that for me there is any particular ancestor because there have been times when i've wanted to find something to connect these ancestors and they weren't even necessarily my ancestors meaning i don't necessarily okay directly descend from these people but I have a strong drive and desire to figure this out to figure out these connections and to help other people figure out okay wait who did you say you were re related to and then I'm off trying to like redo their tree or help them figure out what their um get through their their, their brick walls and things as we say in genealogy so I, I find new things in, in new ways. And sometimes you'll see a name or go back to a document that maybe you had looked at many times. And then all of a sudden it means something different and something clicks and you'll be like, oh, wait, that's that particular person. So um, I do think that it, this is definitely spirit led work for me. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and it is, it's definitely spirit led work for me. And like, I guess I don't have a, a particular ancestor, but I will tell you, um, especially in the beginning, I, I would, I felt like I had like two hands on my back, just pushing mm -hmm. me and pushing me and pushing me to keep searching, 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 not just in the research, but also for the descendants of those enslaved ancestors. And I still do feel that way. Um, because I, I feel like I can't like not do this work. It's almost like it's not even of my own choosing. Um, you know, I was sick last week, so I had to cancel the Thursday call. And, and I really didn't want to cancel the Thursday call. I, I really, really didn't. But I knew that I needed to rest. And, and sometimes <laughs> the guests will tell you our Thursday calls, even though they're from 7 until 9 o'clock. When do we get off the phone, the guests? Sometimes we get off at 2 o'clock in the morning. Oh, ladies, ladies, are you sure? There have been times when we have all dropped off at between 2 and 3 a.m. Eastern. I can believe that because I want to share something with the both of you and the listening audience. Uh, last week, I was doing some research. And of course, when you get into this research, you just can't stop. And it was like 3 o'clock in the morning. I actually wanted to go to bed. I, I, I wanted my ancestors to go back in the room so I can sleep, you know, go back in the office and, and I'll meet them the following morning. Well, I couldn't go to sleep the entire night. And so I said, let me get up and do something. And so I went into the room and something that I had been working on for about a week, trying to piece it together. I pieced it together just that fast. So one thing I found, um, I don't care if people call me crazy at this anymore, you know, because, you know, people will say that we are really crazy. You know, what are they talking about? Ancestors guiding you in the spirit, but they actually do. And I feel that we are our ancestors. We are those that come from the past. 
and we are those that is on the way here, the, those that is unforeseen. And so there is a connection. And I believe when we think about that time and period when our ancestors was chattel property and they was de denied the privilege of an education, they couldn't read, they couldn't write. And so here we are, you know, and this is not the type of courses that they would have taught in school or the universities or college. So we have to go out and we burn in a midnight hour just trying to write and research and, you know, piece together the pieces of the puzzle to learn anything about ourselves, our family, you know, our, our ancestors and to share it with those that want to know. Absolutely. I have um, definitely, uh, I don't know if I was dreaming about it, mm -hmm. but I kind of wake up with something on my mind mm -hmm. and, and then I'll go and I'll just find, I'll find something. Yes. yes, um, yes. And so I, I, I choose to say that that is spirit led and spirit driven. Mm -hmm. um, I don't care what anybody called me. A, a right. Carrie. <laughs> and, yeah. And so when you get there, when you really don't care what people call you, you are free. You see, because the truth sets you free. And I feel like the truth empowered me which, with knowledge of self, something that I would not have found any other way than the pathway that I have taken in following my ancestors. You know, when in the spirit of Sankofa, Sankofa said to go back and fetch the best that the past has to offer. But we're not only fet fetching the, path, the, the best, we are, are researching some atrocities and the ugly part of history that most people are not cut out to do this because it's just too much of a burden. You know, it's a burden when you look at your family members on the auction block, or you know that that person who you're looking at in the slavery in the inventory of that person will maybe not ever see their family member again. That's a reality. And that's why we're doing what we're doing right now. Absolutely. And, 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 um, yes, it, it, it makes me, um, think about, uh, even though you, you said it wasn't any particular ancestor, there's some things we are learning about these ancestors that are like, uh, not being able to put down a really, really good book. It's like turning the pages of a good book. And, and although you don't have a particular ancestor, I have been just fascinated by the Mahoney story from the very beginning. And, 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 and I don't know if it's because Kenneth and I share some of the same Mahoney cousins. And, and then when we learned that his ancestor, uh, Bibian Butler, who was married to Nace Butler, who's the person who's at the very top of the manifest of the ship when they were shipped from, um, uh, from the East Coast down here into New Orleans, you know, everybody always talking about Nace and Bibby, Nace and Bibby, Nace and Bibby. And I think I was at least two and a half, three years into this when I found out that Bibby was a Mahoney. And so we know that you and my husband, Kenneth, y'all share Harry Mahoney as a common ancestor. Uh, you wanna share a little bit about what you know about Harry Mahoney? Sure. So. Um... <laughs> We know that Harry Mahoney was um, a foreman at St. Inigo. And actually there is um, a little story about Harry actually um, helping the fathers when the British came to Maryland during the War of 1812. And the story is sort of that the British were coming um, onto the Jesuit property um, and they were looking for things and in some cases people to take. Um, with them. And so Harry Mahoney actually, I believe, took some of the children who were there and um, also hid some of the Jesuit property that, property that they had. And he put it in a hole so the British could not get to it. And then when the British left, he told the priests um, where the property was. Um, but I think the Mahoney family in general, based on some of the documentation, and of course this documentation is things written by the Jesuits who enslaved them, were thought of as people who were 
um, trusted. They were um, trusted by their owners. There were people who had uh, lots of different trades and skills. Um, and they were very, very spiritual people. Um, and they were proud of that spirituality and their connection to God. And we see that also in Louisa Mahoney, who even after her enslavement and was ended was um, described as an extremely pious woman and a very faithful Catholic, so. And, you know, you mentioned that they were trusted um, and, and I, I think they were trusted because they were immensely loyal. Um, yeah, that is also how they, they are described. And um, I think for me, that description takes on a lot of different meaning, right? So um, when your owner describes you as loyal, what does that really mean? It doesn't necessarily mean that you're, you are content with being owned. And so we know that some of the Mahonies actually sued for their freedom. So obviously they were not content. Um, Harry Matthias Mahoney was not a part of that lawsuit. He was born later, um, but they were using the connections that they had in order to fight for their freedom in different ways. Some of them did run away and escape. So, when we say that they're loyal and we, we use the descriptors used by their enslavers, we wanna make sure that we're not saying that they were satisfied with their enslavement. That's not what we mean at all. Right. right. And, and, and one of the things that I uh, think about when I, when I use that word just now is about uh, even to this day, how loyal uh, many descendants have been to the Catholic faith. And I think it was uh, really more about their faith that kept them um, connected, um, uh, not just to the Jesuits, but to each other. Um, and so uh, that's what I mean when I say loyal. Uh, I, I, I am definitely not about to promote a happy slave narrative. That's not me, no way, no how. How did you feel when you uh, learned about the role that Harry played in the War of 1812? So um, that is something that I find to be so interesting about these ancestors is that um, they even then viewed not as human, obviously viewed not as citizens, still had um, pride in themselves and um, knew the value of loyalty and had their own understanding of what was right and what was wrong. Um, from their standpoint. And even when I look back at the number of um, previously enslaved men from places like St. Mary's County, you find that there is an enormous number of them who left their places of enslavement um, and fought in the Union. There, were, and there was a lot of representation from folks coming from Southern Maryland who fought um, and a number of them continue to fight on. There are some ancestors, particularly in the, um, the Green family, um, who stayed on. They were Buffalo soldiers. Some of them um, continued on in several um, wars uh, following that time period. Their descendants also were active duty representatives. And we're talking about, we're talking about doing freedom. We're talking about doing resurrection. We're talking about people who were traveling all over the country in places like Missouri, um, places where you would not see a lot of black people. Um, and they were serving this country and still not being treated as equals, even at that time. And then their children also served. Um, so I think seeing that is something that makes me extremely proud. Um, and they were able to say to themselves um, in some kind of way, you know what? my ancestors fought to be counted as human beings and as citizens. And this is how I'm going to uphold their contribution. And I'm gonna con contribute to this country in this way as well. Now, Nagas, so often when um, people are doing research on African-American families, they say, well, you know, after the um, 1870 census, I can't find any more information on my ancestors. 
Can you share some of the other resources that we use in, uh, in, in some of the uh, uh, information we've been finding out? Uh, uh, and, and if you need to share your screen, you can do that. Um, but we don't just use the census records and we don't just use online records. Right. We don't just use the census records. Um, I will also say that you should not make assumptions about, unless you have clear evidence that your ancestors were enslaved up until that point, don't make that assumption because I did that a lot only to find that my ancestors received their freedom or were able to purchase themselves and their families much earlier. So still go back and check the records as far as you can. Um, there are a couple different resources that I use. Um, for Maryland, um, there was a special census that took place um, and that, that was a census for free African-Americans. It took place in 1832. Um, and I believe these records could be found in, um, in Ancestry. If you take a look at some of the different um, special records that we have, I'm going to try to see if I can find one of the um, one of those record stores. But in the state of Maryland, there was um, a society that a col colonization society that was actually looking to take free um, black people and send them to Liberia, and so they took a special census. Um, to document everyone who was free at that time and then offer them to go to Liberia. And there actually were quite a few folks in St. Mary's County and other places in Southern Maryland who actually did go to Liberia. There are some um, folks with the surname Barnes who uh, some of them are cousins and some of them were actually um, descendants of those enslaved by the Jesuits who actually went to Liberia. Um, so you may find those connections as well. Um, then there is another, there's actually a, a, a book that I've been using that documents really well some of the Jesuit plantations in Maryland. And that book is called The Manor is Ordinary by John Lafarge. And I'm trying to pull up the... Can you repeat the name of that while you are trying to pull that up? The Manor is Ordinary? The Manor is Ordinary. Can you see my screen? Oh, yes, yes. Yep, by John Lafarge, The Manor is Ordinary. Now, I, this book is um, pretty old. Um, it's not solely about the enslaved population, of course. It's, it's about the Jesuits in general. This was first written in the 1950s, um, but I have been able to find electronic versions of this, doc, of this book online as well. It has some very interesting information about um, the Jesuits in general, and um, talks, uh, gives reference to some of the um, enslaved population as well. I believe there is are some references to the Mahoney family in the book as well. And, and while you're mentioning books, and, and, and if you want, um, take a moment, to, if there's anything else you want to pull up, pull it up. But uh, one of my, uh, my favorite resources, I don't know if you could see it here, it's, it's backwards. It's called Cash for Blood by uh, Ralph Clayton. And it documents the uh, Louisiana, um, Baltimore to Louisiana slave trade. Um, and, 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 and it also kind of tells you a little bit about some of the major slave traders. Uh, not, and, and it also uh, has a list of surnames. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, it's not all of them. And, and you can certainly find some additional um, ship manifest uh, online by looking at the uh, inward bound um, slave manifest, which uh, shows many of the uh, ships that came into the port of New Orleans uh, after the transatlantic slave trade had ended. And because the slave trade had ended, they had to include uh, people by name, and many of them, not all, but many of them came in with last names. And mm -hmm. so um, if you remember from the surname list that I put up earlier, there were uh, surnames like Queen and Hawkins, and those are some very well-known Maryland names. Uh, those are definitely in that book by Ralph Clayton, Cash for Blood. I have a question uh, for you and the guests. Karen, I guess I start off with you. 
with all of this information that you're finding, and I know that it involves your family uh, on your husband's side, how how is the family receiving this family history? Um, because you've got to pass it down to somebody. Let's start off with you first. Well, uh, some of the younger members of the family were definitely excited to hear about this history. Uh, and, um, and some of the older members of the family were surprised. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they didn't know that they had come from Butler's. They knew they came from Hawkins's. They didn't know they came from Butler's. Um, and so um, as with genealogy, um, and you know this, it's, almost, it's always hard to get um, people really as excited about it as we are. But what I do find is that they want to know the history. They don't want to do the work to get to the history always, because you know this is some painstaking work. But uh, people want to know about their family, and uh, you know I've taken family members out to the cemetery in Iberville, the cemeteries mm -hmm. in Iberville uh, Parish. I tell you what, one of my young nephews came from Texas, and um, and he wanted to learn more about his family history. Okay, and I know that our guests uh, have another appointment that she needs to go to. Uh, but just before we, um, she depart the show for tonight, I would like to ask her the same question. How mm -hmm. is your family receiving all the information that you are finding the guests? Um, I do a lot of, uh, you mean how they get it, how they receive information from me? Yeah, I mean, are, are they happy with your findings? Or? Oh, yeah, they're extremely excited. I'm actually going to be looping them into some of the Thursday calls as well. Okay. So um, I'm excited about having them participate. Yeah, well, the guess is it has been a pleasure for the second time um, interviewing you and talking with you and continue to have a happy hunt. Okay, thanks so much. Thank All you right. so much for joining us in the guest. Bye. Bye. All right. You uh, know, Erin, as always, um, researching and compiling family history is important. But I always tell everyone, you have to do something beyond, you know. What is the plans for most of the research that you all are doing? Um, are you all talking to Georgetown University to look at uh, repositing any information there? What is the plans if there is any? Well, uh, one of the other resources we uh, didn't share yet was the uh, Georgetown Slavery Archives. Would you like and, to share it? Um, uh, well, I actually, I wasn't going to pull up the page, but if mm -hmm. you just go, if you just Google Georgetown Slavery Archive, mm -hmm. you will see a number of, of items in, um, in their list. Uh, and some of that includes stories, uh, whether it's news articles or also information from descendants, as well as uh, just a lot of uh, information mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. uh, Jesuit enslavement. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I could see happening in the future is as more descendants come into knowledge and descendants are finding various ways to share their own family history. And I, I was reading a journal that was posted um, in the Georgetown Slavery Archives and it, it, it included an article uh, about uh, a descendant who had done a summer internship. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and as she was learning, she, you know, she had that, that amazing experience you have when you realize, oh my God, that's my family. Yes, yes. And, and, and because she's connected to some of the research in St. Louis, I would imagine that she will be learning and sharing all at the same time, which is what most of us do. We're, mm -hmm. we're learning and we're sharing. And so, and I encourage people to, uh, whether you're gonna, um, you know, because of you, I tell people, look, you need to put your stuff in the local university archive. Some, uh, yeah. <laughs> I put it somewhere. And, and I know you blog, uh, you know, I just tell people, this history doesn't belong to any one of us. It, is, it belongs to right. all of us. And, and so and we, tell your story. 
Right. Well, we recognize that we must think about those that will come behind us that will want to uh, research the family history and to, and to add on. When I first started researching in 1994, it was so limited to what you would find in the library outside of Michael Fish, Michael Fim, which was the census and perhaps someone um, scanned the secession records. But my point is, we need to think in terms of, okay, it's our history, our story, our, our responsibility to make sure we write it into the history books, make the films, record the aura interviews so that that person that will come, we have left them something. That's one way. And the second way, the second thing I think about is how could scholars, how could students who are writing their thesis and filmmakers find it if it's sitting in your home <laughs> on the bottom shelf and nothing is being done with it? Yes. Uh, and, you know, I, I know a couple of people who are, are writing books, uh -huh. or writing books. And uh, so many have been interviewed by numerous uh -huh. new publication. So that's another way of documenting the history, even uh -huh. though someone else is interviewing you. Uh, students at Georgetown have interviewed many, many, many descendants. Uh -huh. There is an oral history project um, at LSU. Um, also American Ancestors uh, Georgetown Memory Project uh, has also compiled a number of um, oral histories. Uh -huh. So those are some of the ways. Um, <clears throat> I also want to share another resource and that is the uh, Slavery History Memory and Reconciliation Project. Uh, it's uh, jesuits.org slash our work hyphen, our hyphen work slash SHMR. That's Slavery History Memory and Reconciliation. And, 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 and at that website, we're learning a lot more about some of the um, ancestors who went mm -hmm. west, west into the St. Louis area, mm -hmm. uh, right near uh, Ferguson, Missouri. Um, so that's another uh, really good uh, resource for, for learning. And then also there's the Woodstock Papers. Uh, you can get a link to that from the Georgetown Slavery Archive as well, or you could just Google uh, Jesuit Woodstock Papers and it'll come up. Um, it's hundreds of pages, but it has some information. Mm -hmm. and, and one thing I want people to realize is that, um, and I have a question for you from the, um, from the live chat. One thing I want people to understand is that sometimes information is written and it's indexed for the white people who were involved. Right. It's not written in index for the black people who were involved. So you may actually have to do some deep reading mm -hmm. to come up with our ancestors mm -hmm. uh, in them. So from the chat, uh, Connie Green wants to know, how would I find a record of a specific plantation? The Mississippi Department of Archives don't seem to have it. And I know you have some, um, some history with Mississippi. <laughs> yeah. Um, sometimes uh, if no genealogy society have documented those plantations, or if the family who own the plantation have not donated it to some type of um, repository, it may be difficult, but I will suggest that she Google the plantation and she go to Mississippi Gen Web and put and, and just see what it has to offer because not every area would have, do have donated those files, break down the county that she's researching. Example, if she was researching through the Mississippi Web Genealogy website, that's a free site, uh, and look at uh, the different, they may have plantations, they may have schools, they may have uh, diaries and secessions, but that's where I would start at because I know that brick wall that she's running into because a lot of the plantations uh, was not documented, unfortunately, a lot of them. And uh, 
I would imagine that if you're looking at will and probate records, you may come across some names of uh, yeah. plantations as well. But you uh, must know the last slaveholder. And that's something else I would su suggest to her. Google that person's name. And if she is a member of Ancestry, search for a public tree in that slaveholder's name, as well as go to family search and put his name in to see what may come up about that plantation owner. Yeah, that's a very good idea because I have definitely seen, even with some of our DNA matches, mm -hmm. it'll, like as they list the slaveholding family's name, it'll list what plantation they owned or lived on. Exactly. And if you, that. <laughs> exactly. And if you go into that gallery, uh, take your time and go into the gallery because there may be some things in that gallery. I know we found Egypt Plantation in East Feliciana. Mm -hmm. That's how we found Egypt Plantation, you know, and come to find out there is more than one Egypt Plantation in Mississippi. So what was this coalition of Egypt Plantations? But it was. Yeah, it makes you wonder why Egypt? I mean, why Egypt? Yes, yes, yes. So I would do that. So I, I think in terms of the reason that I blog, I blog, that's a way that I share my findings, whether that's photographs, whether it's documents, and that's a way to share. And when you write a story or you share something about someone else's family, that is the best gift that you can give someone. And documenting the community history is so much fun because I'm learning things that I would not have ever known exist in the Florida parishes if I wasn't researching African-American, researching and documenting African-American history in this area. And, and, and you're so right. And so when it comes to Jesuit enslavement, our community just happens to be a little bit larger. Yes. Because we're looking at the connections between Maryland, Louisiana, Kentucky, and Missouri. Missouri. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and then, um, you know, once you even bring in some of the DNA connections, we're finding Pennsylvania also, mm -hmm. and Delaware, mm -hmm. uh, and, and even as far up as uh, Boston. Um, yeah. Karen, I want to share something with you that I'm very, very proud of. When I started, uh, I know we did the last show about the images in the book, but since that time that I talked with you, I learned that the book is being sold at every Walgreens in Tangeville Hole Parish, from Punchatula to Amit. Now, why is that such a big deal? It's a big deal because it's our history, it's our story that's being told through images. And the fact that when I published the book, I had I didn't think about the book being sold at Targets or anywhere, Amazon, I didn't think of that. I was just basically trying to document the history of ordinary people with extraordinary stories. And to know that on this day, it is being sold in Walgreens in this parish here. And people are running out and they're buying it because they feel this is about us. This is us. This is, this is, I didn't know, like when I find things. And when people look at it, and everybody that purchased the book in this parish, they know somebody. They would say, I, that was my school teacher. Uh, I went to church with them. Yes, I remember that business, you know, and it's one way to keep family history alive. And as I work on the second book, it would have more documents in it, the second one. Well, I think that um, what people have to realize is that every day that you live your life, you are creating history. Yes. And, 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 now we're taking so many more photographs mm -hmm. than were taken uh, back when some of those photographs were taken. And so we need to be conscious of how we keep, organize, preserve, and share 
those photographs so that mm -hmm. they are also documenting the history li we're living through right now. And, and are we putting them in a, a way somewhere, sharing them in a way that they will be uh, a, a, around for future generations to find? And it's up to us to do that now uh, in our four minutes before closing. We're the ones now, you know, we're the ones. And I think that we're making some great decisions uh, to document the stories just with the Zooms here and putting it, putting it on YouTube. People can always go back and look at it. So in our own way, we're looking at more creative ways, whether that's through electronic newsletters, uh, the blogs, um, five to ten minutes, <laughs> Facebook, Facebook family pages, Facebook group pages, Instagram, just use it all to your advantage to help tell the story. And you never know what will come out of it. Uh, so it's been a great, I always learn so much from you when you're talking about the Jesuit uh, research and all that you all do. And to think that you all had 44 people. You just can't shut it down because the hour has passed. You know, it just, it's just the spirit of the ancestors is all over you. They're on you. You just don't shut them. Just because you say, okay, time is up. They don't say time is up. You know, they're with you. Not at all. Not at all. This truly, it truly brings a lot of joy uh, to know that I'm, I'm helping to tell their stories. Now, something I want to say, each week that we come on the show, we almost have colors that's, that's so <laughs> similar. It's like my piece goes with I need that, that for the dress. <laughs> did you notice that? I see that. It's like, okay, we are, we are spiritually connected. It's, we are cousins, you know? It's just so much is there with that, you know? <laughs> it's just beautiful. And we know? do not. We do not discuss what we're wearing. We do not. We do not. And Karen, it, I... If I never told you this before, and I'm telling you now, it's such a pleasure to have you, to be connected with you as a cousin. And I feel a connection to your grandmother, your great aunts and uncles and your grandfather, who I remember, your great grandfather, I remember going to his funeral when I was a little girl, you know, mm -hmm. and so I know they are saying they are so proud of what you and I have accomplished and how we keep the history alive. Well, thank you. And I'm just so glad you kind of brought me on into all of this. Um, I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy it. And I, I really appreciate um, the connection. <laughs> yes, yes. In more ways than one. So, co-host, it's up to you to close this segment out tonight. Okay, I want to thank everybody who are who uh, who's in the chat room watching us, and 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 Connie, I will I will get once we close out the chat room. I think will still be open. I will get to answering a couple of more of your questions. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, on YouTube on Facebook. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, please subscribe, hit the notification bell so that you can be notified of uh, when we're on live again. And thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you next week. All right. So Karen, thank you. And um, before closing out, I just want to say to everyone, happy family time. And use this time to make some new pictures because we're going to be looking at pictures totally different for 2020, you know, because so many people couldn't get together. There's going to be a whole lot of Zoom shots and new books because that's the way that we are taking pictures. So I have you to know that Karen and I always take Zoom pictures <laughs> of our show because that's the way that we meet and connect. So there it is. I just did one. Very easy. <laughs> and I want to thank the guests. Like, uh, thank you so much, the guests, uh, uh, for being our guest tonight. All right. Good Everybody night. Bye-bye. Good night.